welcome to a special episode of the Movie Scramble podcast. On today's show, we have a Q&A for the live action short film Feeling Through. The Q&A is hosted by Whoopi Goldberg and features executive producer Marley Matlin, director Doug Rowland, actor Robert Tarango and actor Stephen Prescott. The film is a coming-of-age story which follows Tariq, a teen wandering the streets of New York, desperate for a place to sleep, when he encounters Artie, a deaf-blind man in need of help getting home. What begins as an awkward meeting between strangers quickly becomes an intimate bond between friends and a journey that forever changes Tariq. The film, shortlisted for the 2021 Academy Award for Best Live Action Short Film, is the first film to star a deaf-blind actor. Please enjoy the Q&A, which follows a short clip from the film. During the Q&A, you will hear the voice of the sign language interpreter for both Marley and Robert. Thanks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You've never seen a blind and deaf guy before? Hello, my name is Whoopi Goldberg. I am short. I have round glasses. My name is a W, and I have a hair kind of like an octopus in a funny kind of way, but I'm cute. And I am here because I'm talking with the folks who've made a, a, an amazing film called Feeling Through. And I just want to tell you that it has already racked up one million views in the last three weeks. And it's the first film to star a blind deaf actor and was inspired by a real life encounter that the writer had. Doug has partnered with Helen Keller Services to authentically cast the film and create a fully accessible screening event around the film, The Feeling Through Experience, which they took across the country first in person and now virtually. Feeling Through has won 16 awards on the festival circuit and hit 1 million views in the first three weeks. So I want to introduce Doug Rowland, who is the writer, director, and producer. Marley Matlin, who is executive producer. Robert Tarango, co-lead, first deaf-blind actor to star in a film. And Stephen Prescott, co-lead. So, first, Marley, I have to ask you this question because I would like to know the answer. How, what was it about this project that really got your attention? Because I know how picky you are. So what was it about this that made you want to get involved as an as a executive producer? Uh, hi, Whoopi. Uh, hi. Thank you for that, letting me hop on the, the description. First of all, I'm going to describe myself, what I look like. I'm a white woman with long, curly hair, and I'm wearing a blue jacket with a pink blouse. And I'm not as cute as you are. <laughs> but we're going to go ahead. Um, uh, when I was uh, approached by Doug uh, to have an opportunity to see the film, I, I sure, I, I thought, fine, I, I'd be happy to look at it. I had never taking my eyes off the screen the entire time, for the entire 18 minutes, I, my mind was blown by the authenticity of the film, by the, the actors' performances, by the storytelling, by everything, by the filmmaking that Doug put together here. And what really excites me about it, I mean, if, if something excites me like that, it means that I need to pay more attention to it. And from the moment that I saw the film, the first moment, I was hooked. And we connected, and I can say that the rest is history because I had to hop on. I really did. And so you decided I have to be part of this. What is the what's the thing that made you say I've never seen anything like this before? Because it's very unique. This movie. Well, that's true because it, the fact it, the uniqueness is because it is. We've never seen a film d display authenticity like this, using an actor who is deaf and blind in a role that is deaf and blind itself. It's never been done in film history before. You'll, you'll see people you know, portraying disability like a costume. They'll you know, take it off and put it on. And in this case, this is unique because it is authentic. And what's more, we 
there are, I mean, there's always stories that are about, you know, if you have a character who is deaf or a character who is blind in a, in a film, in a movie, for example, or even in television. Any, any character with a disability is always talked about that, oh, okay, they are disabled. We are talking about the disability. We are making it about the disability. And in this case, this film is not. This is a film that talks about a connection between two different people in the middle of the night who want to get home. And that's why I was so attracted to this film. It's a movie about two people, not about being deafblind, not about whatever deafblind issues are out there. So now I'm going to ask you, Doug, what made you decide that I've had this experience and I need to make it an experience that I can share with other people? Uh, well, first, Wolfie, thanks so much for, for leading the conversation today. And uh, my image description, I'm a white male in my mid-30s, short, dark hair, little light little scruff on my face, wearing a blue jacket and a plain white backdrop. And, you know, every now and then we have those, those moments in life where every molecule in your being is firing, knowing that in that moment you're going through something that will change you moving forward. And that's really how I felt in my interaction with Artemio 10 years ago, who's the p person that this film is inspired by. You know, again, it started off really simply as just me, very similar to what you see in the film, me seeing Artemio standing on the street holding a sign that said, I'm deaf and blind and need help crossing the street. And I, you know, I first, my first thoughts were, you know, this is the first deaf blind person I'd ever met. Really just seeing him, that was what was the most resonant thing. But after I spent this hour plus waiting for, for a bus with him and really getting to connect in the same manner that you see the two characters in the film, me drawing one letter at a time on his palm, him writing back in a notepad, I got to know this man as this really charismatic, warm, and just like beautiful person who had this smile that would light up any room that he'd be in and was just someone that I felt like I'd made a really profound connection with. And it was after we were giving each other big hugs goodbye and I'm kind of tearing up a little bit having this real New York moment of this fleeting intimacy as he drives off into the night wondering if I'll ever see my new friend again. I realized that in this one interaction I'd gone from initially seeing this man as his disability like oh wow the first deaf blind person I'd ever met to seeing him as my new friend that's going off into the night that I hope our paths will cross again. And there was just so, there was so much from that interaction that stuck with me, but it was one of those things where like, it, it was just firing in my, in my chest and my gut. And I just knew that I needed to somehow find some way to share whatever it was that I was gaining in that moment with other people. And it was, it was quite a long journey to get to here, but it was something that I just, it was just one of those few instances in life where you just have that gut feeling the moment something's happening, that this is significant. So how difficult was it when you set out to make this to find an authentic deafblind actor? That's a great question. You know, I, I knew, so at, at the time that I actually set out to make this film, which mind you was about seven years after the actual event, I wrote the film shortly after, but it lived on my computer for a number of years because I just didn't think I was ready to make it. But when I finally was ready to make it, I just intuitively, I knew I wanted to cast a deafblind actor, but I'd never heard of a, any deafblind actors. And very fortunately, I ended up um, connecting with and then partnering with Helen Keller Services to make this film, which was absolutely necessary because they, you know, Helen Keller, Sur Helen Keller National Center, which is the part of Helen Keller Services that provides services for people who are deafblind, they're based in Long Island and have the largest network of people who are deafblind in the country. Right. They had never, they didn't know any deafblind actors either, but what, <laughs> what they did was they just reached out to anyone that sounded like they fit the description of kind of right. what I was looking for to people all across the country basically saying, hey, there's this guy that wants to make a movie, like, are you interested in acting? And very, very fortunately, actually, um, Robert actually wasn't on our, our casting list the, the, right. um, when we were initially casting, but we had a break in the schedule and Robert was actually working in the kitchen at Helen Keller National Center when we were doing our casting. And uh, halfway through the day when we had a break in, in, the, in our casting schedule, someone in the room goes, hey, what about Robert? Like, I feel like Robert would be great for this. Um, so Robert was just pulled out of the kitchen, not really being explained where he was going, 
lands right. in this room with some guy with a camera and is being told he's auditioning for a movie. And I guess you could say the rest is history. But um, <laughs> yeah, we it was such a fortunate thing to be able to partner with Helen Keller National Center to to be able to have that network to reach out to and 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 have all the accessibility needs we needed to to make it happen. So I have a crazy question to ask Stephen. <laughs> Stephen, what was it like to discover that you were going to be playing what ostensibly was a white guy? Well, thank you, Whippy, for facilitating this. And my image description is I'm a black male, box braids and a man bun uh, with a white turtleneck. Uh, when I first heard that I was uh, being casted, I actually didn't know that the story was related to uh, Doug's encounter. Right. It was real life. You know, just uh, when I read the script, you know, I, I felt that it was uh, universal, you know, so uh, just being casted in it, you know, I was just uh, excited to be a part of it. And my first time playing alongside someone who's a deaf blind actor, you know, it was an amazing ex experience. Yeah. Well, I, I want to say, Robert, in a way, you are a magical being. Because we, I don't think many of us have met a deaf-blind artist, an actor. So what was it about this story that made you say, okay, I will, I will, try, I will try this out. This, this could be good for me. Hi, everyone. My name is Robert. My image description is I'm wearing a gray shirt. I have gray hair tan skin, and I'm in my 50s. I was really motivated to be involved with this film because I wanted a real deaf-blind actor cast in this role. It's never been done before. This industry is so competitive. I couldn't believe that Doug picked me for this role. Instantly, I wanted to jump right on and be involved with this film. I wanted to pave the way for the deaf-blind community. To show them that it wasn't another hearing-sighted person playing a deafblind character. I wanted to be their role model, to inspire them, to realize that they can do it too. And that was what really inspired me and what motivated me to be involved with this film. Molly, I want to ask, I know the answer to this, but I, I want you to speak to why it's important to have authentic casting when you can. Well. Do we have five hours? Um, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, in reality, it's, I can start by saying why authenticity is important because I can go back to 1985 when I auditioned for Children of a Lesser God, my first film. The whole experience, the history of the casting of that film of Children of a Lesser God, the the being able to get into the film, then going on to win a Golden Globe, and then an Oscar, and then getting all that attention, and then throwing people off because, oh, wait a minute, there's a deaf actor playing this role in Children of a Lesser God? And, I mean, there were critics who said, well, how is she acting? She, she won the Oscar out of pity. She um, was a deaf person playing a deaf role. So how is that considered acting? And, well... You know me, Bobby. I didn't stop there. And I wouldn't <laughs> let them define me. I wouldn't let them say, okay, you're, you're authentic, so what? Uh, I just continued, and I'm still here. So authenticity for me means it's, it's we, we can't look at disability, as I said earlier, as a costume that, that an actor can put on and take off. You are cast authentically as an actor because whether you're deaf or you're deafblind or you're disabled, or your person of color, even. It's, it's about experiencing the truth in the story and, and displaying that truth. We have to stop the artifice uh, where acting is about taking on somebody that is not who you are. Uh, you know, we have to stop all the isms in Hollywood, the racism, the autism, the ageism, whatever, and, and focus on authenticity in portrayals. It, and it's, it's about the truth of the character. And it's, there are so many talented deaf actors out there, deafblind people out there, disabled actors out there that could do so much and could contribute so much to the industry. And a lot of times, and I'm talking about the past, a lot of times people, producers, directors, even writers will say, well, let's use them and put them in the background and let's, mm -hmm. we'll have that box checked. And you know what? It's time for us to carry the films. It's time for us... As I said, we don't have to dwell on 
the disability. We don't have to dwell on being deaf or being deaf blind. It's time to focus on the story. It yeah. was that. And I'm still fighting and I'm still looking to collaborate with deaf, deaf blind actors, disabled actors to all work together with the industry to make things happen. The people who have the power in Hollywood to make things happen. And that's why I was so impressed with what Doug had did and that he, he reached out to Helen Keller Services because it was all about people who know how to get it done. People who know how to tell the story, people who know how to bring them into the into the mix. He did his homework, and, and that's why I was so, so impressed and happy to hop on board this project and go on this journey with it. And also, what it will mean now for deaf-blind actors and actors with different abilities, because you know, if if it was difficult for Doug to find the actor, because you know, didn't know to. You know, couldn't go to this agent or that agent and say, do you have? So now we need to populate this world, our world of actors with more differently abled actors. You know, I have to ask, Doug, did you have to make the set accessible for Robert in particular? Or was there technology? How, How did you make this work? Great question. And right before I answer that, just to pick up on what you were just talking about, to your point will be something that's so cool about this experience is that now having had the opportunity to take this film around the country, fortunately, prior to the pandemic, we got to do these fully accessible screening events with as many as 50 interpreters and support staff at a single screening to provide one to one accessibility so that anyone could join in and have these panel discussions and Q&A's. And then, and also taking it out online and having million plus people see it, I've gotten so many responses from the mm-hmm. deafblind community. Not only that they're so thankful for the per, their inclusion and portrayal in this story, but a lot of people who are deafblind who say, "I want to be an actor now. I mm-hmm. I want to do this." And that's what's so cool about it. And you know, Ro- Robert can talk more about this later. But something that I actually found out after the process was that actor, um, Robert, you always wanted to be an actor. You just didn't think it was possible because you didn't see yourself on the screen. And, you know, I think this is something that, you know, Whoopi, Marley, you you know better than anyone here, uh, that is fortunately getting more attention in Hollywood. But for me, what's been so cool about this process is seeing it through Robert's journey, through the deafblind community that's reached out, very tangibly and specifically why it's important. It's important because there's so many talented, beautiful people out there who don't even have in their consciousness the fact that this is a possibility because they never see it. And all it takes is that one person to do it, to open up this new space to go, I can do that too. I want to do that and I will do that. And that's what's been so cool. But uh, to answer your question, Whoopi, about accessibility, yeah, that was you know, this has been this three year journey from when I first approached Helen Keller Services to now has been an absolute masterclass in accessibility. And the way we handled it on set was very fortunately, again, got to work very closely with Helen Keller National Center and Robert ahead of time to make sure that we made this set as accessible as possible. Um, that meant creating, you know, and again, Robert can certainly speak for himself on this, but, you know, Robert still relies on some vision that he has left, but at night where we, 95% of this movie is shot on location at night in New York City, he's completely blind. So we had to set up various um, lighting scenarios to be able to facilitate um, communication and with the interpreters and Robert, and obviously make sure we had an amazing communication team on set at all times to help, um, you know, the communication. So, you know, it was one of those things where Just to note that, I think a lot of times, and you know, Marley, I know we've talked a lot about this and Jack, but people kind of take this on as as if like, oh, accessibility, it's a whole nother thing we have to worry about. It's like costly, it's so much trouble. I mean, movies are challenging and cost money. That's, That's just a given, anything you do in a film is hard. But with the accessibility, it actually created such an, a beautiful, like family vibe on set and to have this whole new dimension for myself, for almost everyone else on the crew, to have a new experience, breathed a new kind of life into this experience that I think was not only not not only something that made it like harder or subtracted from it, but was super additive to it and made it like this unique, beautiful experience that it wouldn't have been without that. So 
it was definitely a learning curve, but like such a beautiful new dimension to have as part of storytelling. Right. I want to ask Stephen because as as an actor, you are now immersed suddenly in a world that I don't know if you know very many deaf blind artists or deaf actors. What was it like for you? Did you have to learn some signing? What what did you have to do? And were you a little bit freaked out because you were in such an, a different world? Yes, yes, I was a bit uh, a tad freaked out just a bit before I like stepped in. But um, when I met Robert, I wasn't like all of that like went out of the window. Like, you know, Robert, we build like such a great connection and that's always important with me when I meet like any artist. And um, I, I felt like Robbie was really talented. Right. So uh, it was easy for us to have that chemistry on set. And um, thankful for the staff of Helen Keller, we were able to communicate and find creative ways for us to like, you know, know when it was time when the camera was action and when it was time for us to like stop and things like that. So, you know, it was very creative and fun at the same time. Excellent. So uh, Robert, I would imagine for a deafblind person, tactile signing is a key element for interaction. And at, how was this handled during this pandemic time? I mean, how, how do you do everything that you need to do in the time of social distancing? This is Robert speaking. Well, it's hard right now. It's hard to communicate. Mostly I'm at home, so I'm communicating with my family. I do, we text message back and forth. My family is hearing. My mom does sign a little bit, so I can communicate with her as well as my sister. My sister also has Usher syndrome. So that's the cause of my deaf blindness as well. We both have Usher syndrome. But really for us, the biggest thing is being together as a family and technology really has been groundbreaking for us and really has helped with communication as a whole. Right now with everybody with masks on, it is a challenge. It really does impede communication. Um, you really can't human guide when you actually physically grab somebody's arm because of touch. So now I really am a little bit more reliant on using my mobility cane to navigate. But, you know, really it's not an easy time right now and it's causing a lot of communication mishaps. So we just have to figure out other ways to communicate. You know, we text back and forth. I still have some vision, so I use a video phone to communicate so I can still call and get in touch with other people. And I'd like to follow up, if you don't mind, Whoopi, uh, to what both Stephen and Robert said. And that Stephen mentioned at first that there was a little bit of hesitation about what to expect before meeting a deafblind person. And, of course, that's natural. It's the same way with a hearing crew knowing that they're going to have a deaf actor on set or a deaf black, blind actor for that matter. It's the same thing. It's natural that you always want to question how you communicate, but when you come together, you make it happen. You open doors, you open your mind, you open your heart, you meet halfway and you communicate. Did you feel that once everybody understood the story that you would find that you change the hearts and minds of people who you were working with? Because I can't imagine that this story did not shake some folks up and perhaps have people looking at the world a little differently. I'll give that to you, Doug. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's the beautiful thing about storytelling is that at the end of the day, whether you're on set or you're watching the finished product later, you're, you're all there with that like common focus on the story that ultimately whatever trepidation or fears or questions that people have, the story is something that people really rally around and connects people ultimately. And, you know, one, one kind of anecdote that comes to mind um, off the top of my head on set was, you know, I think initially, as Marley was just saying, I think it wasn't just something that Steven was thinking about. There were a lot of crew members on set where that, you know, some would even express the fear of working with Robert because it was a very unknown thing for them. And they, a lot of times when people have no exposure to something, they are fearful. Again, you know, rep why representation is important, but we'll get, you know, we can, that's a whole other discussion. But there was a moment where it was very cold when we shot this outside at night in a winter in New York. People were cursing my name a lot on set for making those choices. But, 
you know, there was this key scene between Steven and Robert where on the bench where um, the, at the bus stop where we did a wide shot and had this whole scene play out. And it was really challenging. There were a lot of little micro beats to it. And it was tough. And, you know, Robert was struggling with it and we all were kind of struggling with it. We went back inside to like warm up and really go through this scene micro beat by micro beat. And for this like two minute scene, we probably spent 45 minutes to an hour going through each second of it and really beat micro beat by micro beat. And you saw everyone in the holding room, they were kind of warming up and you just slowly saw them all turn their focus, watching us work together, seeing how committed Robert was to making this happen and how hard he was working as a first time actor, mind you, which is no easy feat. And, and we, we got walked right back outside. First take, Robert nailed it. And I, I mean, everyone on that crew rallied around him and was cheering and patting him on the back and going like, because they, they saw how much investment there was to get there. And that was a real turning point on set. From that moment beyond, onward, it was such a family feel on set. No one felt awkward or weird. We'd had that like bonding moment. And I think people experience that when they watch the film too. We fortunately have had the opportunity to share this film with, you know, in person prior to the pandemic with thousands of people where there would be a lot of the deaf, local deaf blind community present alongside the general public. And so many people who had never experienced, um, known anything about the deaf blind community would come up to us after and say, this was a life changing experience for me. I now feel like I have a personal connection to this community that I prior prior to this knew nothing about. And I also get so many emails of people who've seen this film and then like a day later or a week later see a person um, who's maybe blind trying to navigate a situation. They know how to re approach that person respectfully, ask them if they need help and navi help navigate them somewhere if they do say they need help and right. say how that it's changed their way of thinking about and interacting with communities that they pr previously were maybe trepidatious or fearful of because they didn't know anything about. And that's, that's like, that's the power of storytelling is it's like this beautiful singular vessel that we can kind of all put our focus in on and then like come out feeling like much more connected than we did when we went in. All right. I have to ask you, Robert, because <laughs> you're a first time actor and acting is, it's not, easy um but i'm curious as to how surprised were you when you discovered all of the itty bitty minutia kind of things that go into making a film were you very surprised by it yes i was this is robert speaking there's a lot that goes into it but you know in my heart, my gut, I knew this was right for me, that I can do it. And again, this is my first time ever acting. I have never been worked in this business before. So I had a great team. We worked together. We talked about it. And I have to say, I will, will never forget that moment where I sat in the movie theater and I saw myself on screen for the first time. I couldn't believe it. That Everything that we did to actually make this, it was amazing. I still, I'm still in awe from that experience. And I couldn't stop smiling the entire time to realize that, wow, I made it. I finally did it. I'm so proud of myself. And knowing that, you know, not knowing or being in this business to realize that I can do it and how successfully I did it. I can't tell you how much that, how good that felt. I will assume that having a, a great co-actor helps. I have to, again, ask you, Stephen, the two of you are marvelous in this movie. I want to start with that. Thank and you. I wonder what you were taking away from this experience as you were working with an actor who no one had ever really, has ever really seen before on screen, an actual actor who is deaf blind. Were you aware of it or did it just fade from your mind and you were just working with another actor? Yes, yes, because I've been asked that question a, a few times, you know, like, you know, how was it working with a deaf blind actor? And like, sometimes it always felt a little difficult to answer because I always felt like it was just a, 
uh, an actor that I was working with. And that's how it felt on set. Like exactly what you said, like it was just, he was just a, a, a co-star and amazing. And the way we was bouncing off of each other was better than a lot of other thespians that I've probably worked or worked right. with in the past. So, yeah, I mean, like, I think it's important. I think what Robert did on, on feeling through already explains itself. Like, you know, you could feel it. I felt, I felt it when I watched him. So, uh, yeah, his, his, his talent speaks for itself already. <laughs> I have to ask you, go ahead. I'm sorry. Cause you did ask like, what did I take from it? In the yeah. Way? Well, I mean, yeah, well, I, I felt that it's, an, I mean, what I took from it that, you know, that authentic casting needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the best and quick way I can answer that. That's a good way to answer So Marley, you have this young man come to you and say, I have this, this piece I want to do and I, I want to direct it and I'm going to produce it and will you EP it? How were you concerned at all with Doug being a director for this piece? Well, I mean, with Doug, I came on after the fact. He brought me in as an executive producer after the film had been produced. So they had already shot the film. Gotcha. So I, I, as I mentioned, how he asked me to watch the film. And, and again, on my, I was just astounded by, and we just hit it off right away. Right. And I'm very grateful that the, the fact that he asked me and that the, the fact that both Robert and Stephen did the work on, that they did on the screen and Doug and the crew and how, how elaborate they were, the, the, everything behind the scenes in front of the camera was just so beautifully done. And again, it's about being authentic. But I think I have to say that if anyone, you know, brings me, say, for example, a script that has to do maybe with a deafblind character or a deaf character or a disabled character, I, the first thing I'll do is I'll read it. If it excites me, if it feels truthful, if it feels believable, if it feels authentic, am I like you who, who get script? I'm sure you do, Whoopi, too, as well. If it makes sense to you, if it makes sense to you for a hop on board, if it does. If it doesn't, then I, maybe I can recommend it to somebody else and mm -hmm. they can can connect them i can make the connection for them so that's what i typically do in that case and what was he like as a as a director <laughs> steven i'm going to also ask robert the same question but i'm going to ask steven first what what was what was doug like as a director uh, doug is very hands-on patient you know explicit he knows what he's looking for what he wants so uh, he was very very great to work with you know, and especially like times when I would, as an artist, sometimes I could second guess myself, you know, so uh, Doug would always pull me to the side and tell me like, you know, you got this, like, you know, just walk me through it. And, and you know, he helped me in the best way possible. And I love what we got from it. So right. yeah, he was very great to work with. And I'm going to ask you the same question because I, I feel like as a first time actor, how did you feel having having uh, Doug as your director? Well, working with Doug, honestly, was wonderful. It was easy and smooth and natural. Anything I needed, he would really take his time to work with me. And, of course, our dynamics were a little different because we also had the interpreter. Sometimes things didn't always translate, so then Doug had to assume the role to really demo it for me. But he was really patient working with me. And I just have to say, he was just a natural. He just, he treated me as if just I was like an average person that my deaf blindness wasn't even a factor. It just, it was a great experience overall and just easy. He's just a wonderful di director and he really thinks about everything. And just, I remember just the final project, I, product, I can't believe what you created, Doug. Now, Doug, what, what is your process? What was your process like? You know, for me, I, I think the first word that comes to mind is collaboration. It's, it's always a collaboration. And, and that's to your point, you know, what you're asking, Whoopi, about me being a sighted and hearing director, you know, telling a story that includes someone who's deafblind and me being a white director who's also telling a story about a person of color. So, you know, for me, it's, it's about casting so important because I don't see, I see actors as direct collaborators in the story that we're telling. So I want someone who's not only like right for the part, but someone who's going to bring something to it that I could never think of or imagine. And that is adding a whole other dimension to what I could ever um, write. 
And I mean, when I tell you with no embellishment that it was like, it was just knowing at first sight the moment, the first moment I saw Robert and also the first moment I saw Steven that they were meant to be in this. I mean, they're, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that as literally as I can. It, it's those like kind of amazing moments you have when you're casting something when you just absolutely know the second they open their mouths, okay, that's it. I mean, like well, we can do the rest of this audition, but like the second you open your mouth, I already knew. And Bye. that it was not just because there were, um, again, I knew them at those moments as just energetically feeling like they were perfect for the roles. But as I got to know them both as people, you know, leading up to the shoot, they were also just had beautiful poet hearts who had things to add to it and, you know, had the ability to come up to Helen Keller National Center and, you know, meet with and hang out with and get to know Robert and work with him individually, get to walk around the streets in New York with with Steven and go on long walks and talks, just getting to know him as a person and, you know, saying from the very start, I'm like, look, this is a collaboration and I want you to feel like you can always bring up anything that you think should be the case here. And you know, with a lot of the st scenes initially with um, Steven, Steven's character Tariq and his two friends in the beginning, like a lot of that was, it, well, almost all of that was improv. It was just kind of like cultivating an atmosphere or an environment. So for me, it's like this, it's like the, like the words on the page are very important, but not gospel by any means. And you know, it's, it's, I always welcome um, collaboration and, and really actually like require that from, from the actors that I'm working with so that it's the best ultimate product. Right. And I, I, well, that's, I, that's called trust. You see, that's called trust, trust. Uh, uh, we need more Doug Rollins, trust uh, directors who trust. Yeah. Well, I think it also speaks to the actors because if the, if the actors trust the director, uh, they're willing to go on this journey. And so, Marley, I, I want to ask you, what changes still need to be made in this industry for deaf and deafblind actors? We have come a long way, uh, even way before my time when I started. Um, there were very few deaf actors, no deafblind actors. Deaf, mm -hmm. deaf actors like Linda Bowes, Mm -hmm. uh, Phyllis Freilich, um, uh, Bernard Bragg, so many deaf actors who preceded me, uh, the generation before me and uh, before them. But they, they tended to focus on theater the, through the National Theater of the Deaf in Connecticut. And they'd been around a long time. Um, and they provided opportunities for deaf actors and who became well-known in the community and well-respected, both, well, actually both in the deaf and the hearing community as well. But... I mean, I, I can say that I've always wanted to be an actor, and I was fortunate enough to have met Henry Winkler, who, who became my mentor, who, and who told me, you know, to believe in myself and to not let anyone tell me otherwise what I should do in my life. And now fast forward, and I continue to act, and having won the Oscar, you know, I thought initially, well, great, I'm on my I'm on the road to success, and I, I still faced barriers. I still... You know, I might get work here and there, but I still found there were barriers in life. And the problem was, is that there was a lack of communication, accessibility, inclusion, and collaboration. There wasn't enough in Hollywood. So that's why I would say to people, um, it, to the deaf community, to tell each other, you know, let's make noise. Let's not be angry noise. Let's say, hello, noise. Hello, we're here. Hello. And people thank me for paving the way for more, uh, to open the doors for deaf actors. But I say to them, no, it wasn't just me. I, and, and I can't even begin to do it alone. Uh, we all have to work together as a community. We all have to make things happen. So now if you're talking about Hollywood today, I think I see more and more roles out there for deaf actors. Now we have a deaf blind actor, but I want to be able to see more films that a deaf actor can carry a film, can tell the story about whatever it is the story is in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to dwell on being deaf. I'm not going to say hide being deaf. We mm -hmm. have stories to tell other than being deaf or being deafblind or being disabled. So I think the doors are opening even more, more and more, more and more directors, more writers, more, I mean, even in terms of casting, more deaf writers, uh, more uh, giving more opportunities. But we just have to keep on talking. We just have to engage. And that's all it really takes. Do you think that, it, that part of the problem in Hollywood is that people feel like, well, it, it'll be a lot easier if it's, if it's somebody who, who 
at the end of the day, uh, they can hear, they can see me and hear me and know what we're doing, and so I don't have to think about it. Do what? How do how do we change people's attitudes in terms of well, it's better for the piece to have someone who can authentically be themselves as well as be part of a story. How do we? What do, what do we? How do we do this? It, it's those people who are unwilling perhaps what i can't be angry at people who don't take the time to learn or who don't take the time to open their minds and and bring us into the conversation i can't be angry at them maybe they don't have the education maybe they're just plain ignorant all i can say is i need to focus on having a good attitude and i'm going to focus on people who are more than willing to think outside the box and it's a new generation. We're in new times. Times now are, it, it's really time to let everyone into the mainstream to do whatever it is that they love to do, whether the, they have a talent or a craft. We all are people that need to be welcomed in. And we all have differences or disabilities or whatever. I mean, everyone has some sort of disability or difference. I mean, I, I, why is it that we have to shut the door just because you're different? I'm seeing more and more people like Doug, like the film that I just did, Coda. The director was more than willing to bring everybody into the mix. I mean, and we had sign masters on the set. We had deaf actors on the set. We had interpreters. We had everything that was accessible. And look how successful it was. So it's okay to say, let's incorporate these people. You want authenticity in telling a story? Fine, let's bring it in. Let's hire authentically cast actors. And I think more and more we're seeing this in social media and the conversation is opening up that we are here we do exist we aren't willing to be hidden any longer i love hearing that D doug tell us about uh the accessible screenings you created for feeling through sure so you know right when we finished the film we knew you know right off the bat we wanted to share it with the community that was really at the heart of it so we knew we first and foremost before we thought about film festivals or anything else we're like we want to create screenings that are really for and include the deafblind community so i worked with the helen keller national center um to to figure out what all the accessibility components we needed to be able to do that and obviously um you know get get the what, however many people we needed to facilitate that and we started setting up screenings across the country so we did we were able to do 14 uh, cities um, prior to the pandemic um, and you know again what that would look like at a, at a screening there'd be as many as 50 interpreters and support staff we'd have people we'd send out an RSVP ahead of time so that people could tell us what accessibility needs they had for, for the screening and then we'd have as many as inter interpreters as needed for people who needed interpreters you know we'd have tactile interpreters um, which is a is ASL signed into the hand for some of the deafblind community We'd have stage interpreters. We'd have closer vision interpreters. Um, we'd have open captions on the screen that were a lot larger than normal um, with a black backdrop so they're easier to read. We'd have audio descriptive tracks for people who are blind or low vision where all of the visuals of the films are being described. Um, and also accessibility needs taken care of to and from the theater. And, you know, again, it was such a, it was an amazing experience. And again, one, one amazing story that stands out that I think kind of encapsulates a lot of, sums up why it was so amazing and important was at our very first screening in Cary, North Carolina, at this beautiful old theater on Main Street, um, we had, you know, again, we had 50 interpreters and support staff at that one, a ton of local deaf, blind, blind, and um, deaf uh, individuals at that screening alongside, um, you know, sighted and hearing of viewers and we would we, we would do the feeling through we would call it the feeling through experience when we do these screenings because we'd not only show feeling through but we had a supporting documentary following the process of making the film that we'd screen as well and then do a panel discussion and Q&A and the one of the very first people that stood up at our very first screening was a gentleman who was deaf blind who had had the entire experience both films and, and the panel tactilely signed in his hand and he stood up and he said I love that film. Um, I, I, I was so moved by it and I'm so happy to know that we have that representation on the screen. But moreover, I love being able to come and experience it in person. People oftentimes assume that because I'm deaf and blind, I, I wouldn't care to go to the movies, but I love this. I love coming to this 
theater and having this shared experience, I just never have the opportunity to do so. And it was such an amazing moment to have that be like literally one of the very first feedback, some of the very first feedback we got at our very first screening because it kind of, you know, we, I'd understood that intellectually at that point, but that really dropped it in for me, you know, in a really immediate and visceral way of like, that's why this is important. You know, that's yeah. why we need to do it this way. And again, we were able to do 14 of those. Um, and, and then when the pandemic hit, as you, you know, noted what be earlier in this conversation, um, it's particularly challenging for the deaf blind community, a community that often relies largely on touch during a time where touch is per prohibited, essentially. So we started to create these um, fully accessible or as, as accessible as we could virtual experiences that would have an interpreter like you see on the screen today, that would have live captioning, that would have a stream text link that was accessible for people who were following along with a braille display. And, and try to create that same accessibility or as at least as much as we could virtually as well and be able to you know share it with so many more people that way um, and it's just been an amazing experience to be to be able to have everyone see it and everyone take part in it and experience it and um, and, and it's, it's it's been a richer experience of, of showing it as a result of that it, I, I, I wonder if it also gives theaters or can give theaters an idea of some of the things they need to be doing in the theater so that everyone is welcome. You know, I, I know that uh, for friends who can't see as well, you know, having things enhanced in a way so that whether you're partially sighted or, you know, half sighted or not sighted at all, you can participate in the experience of seeing things on a big screen and it's like what they do at the opera right because they have the the headphones and I wonder have you all thought about putting together a list of things that theaters can do whether it's for your movie or any movie that has the ability to have any kind of audience come in have absolutely. you all thought about doing that absolutely absolutely I mean uh, most movie theaters do provide captions these days Mm -hmm. They have, I mean, there's different tools that they use. They use either the glasses that you can watch the captions or they have uh, sort of a rear view mirror or a little caption device that you put into the cup holder. Now, naturally, I'd rather yeah, do without that and just watch a movie that has the subtitles right on the screen rather right. than some sort of device. And we're still working on that. And as you mentioned, Whoopi, you know, they have people who, uh, the Sennheiser devices for people who want to hear better or who want, right. who want to have audio description. I love the idea of uh, maybe beginning some sort of, of means to provide larger captions for people who are low vision or deaf blind. Um, so that, that's, that's a great suggestion. And you know, we, we did, what was really great about, you know, figuring out how we could make these screenings as accessible as possible is we did create a document from that, that we have shared with other parties since, mm -hmm. and we're, we're working on, uh, you know, of trying to collaborate with a larger theater chain prior to, you know, obviously theaters right. not being something that we can do right now. But yeah, you know, as Marley was just saying, there fortunately is, you know, technology that's mandated to be implemented in theaters. We found taking it across the country to some smaller cities, mm -hmm. they were they were a little embarrassed when we asked about the accessibility because right. they're like, we know we're supposed right. to have that, but we don't really. So right. that's problematic. But yeah, we it would be so amazing to go above and beyond what is mandated and right. find a way to have, um, you know, interpreters involved and bring in people that can't use the, the captions or the right. audio description and, and find other ways. I, I, w I hope that we get the opportunity on the other side of this to be able to, to, to do that on a larger scale. Well, I, I think it would be a, a really good idea and, and a, a good reminder for smaller theaters to remember that just because a patron hasn't come, they may not feel like there's a place for them to come. So if you offer something that says, I'm working on it, more people will come. But I also think about this for televisions. I know television has a lot of different ways of getting folks to hear and see as best they can, but I have to believe that there are other ways that we haven't thought of yet that are in the mix. And the last question I'm, I have for you, 
is what advice do you have for directors working with actors who are deafblind? So if you're going to cast somebody who is deafblind to play a deafblind character in a movie, my suggestion would be just have patience. It takes a little bit of time. You will have to have an interpreter on set, but just have patience, listen, and I would suggest that you actually go to Helen Keller National Center and take a tour. Really see what the deafblind community is all about. Understand the diverse the diversity within the community and see how we do things and see how we are independent and how we can do everything just in a little different way. But just my other suggestion would be don't be afraid of us. We're all the same. We're all equal. We can do it just as much as anybody else. Wow. And to realize that we can succeed and really the impact it would make to have more deafblind actors in Hollywood is really something that would just be a game changer. And why not? I would suggest that more uh, directors hire and cast more deafblind actors. All right. Well, I have to tell you all again, it's everyone is really wonderful in it. I feel like this is one of those movies that people need to see if only to have a moment of taking a deep breath and watching a slice of life because that's what it is. It's a slice of life. And that's the thing that makes it so sublime is that it's not a, a slice of black life. It's not a slice of deaf blind life. It's just a slice of life. And there are no better films in the world than the ones that give us a view into a world not our own. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Marley. You know, thanks for, for allowing me to come and do this. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Stephen. And I just want to remind people, feeling through, make sure you find it. And that's, that's, our, that's my wrap with you all today. Thank you, Whoopi. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. My goodness. Thank you. My pleasure. My absolute pleasure.